Welcome back to this special edition of 12 Days in March. In this two-part video, John Barber takes a categorical approach to the primary immunodeficiencies. In this section, we will review disorders of the cytoskeleton and phagocytic cells. In this video, we see disorders identified by eponyms. I don't do well with eponyms and memorization. I need to understand the underlying pathogenesis to manage these conditions. As such, my commentary in this section is definitely expanded to facilitate my understanding of the diseases. Hi, welcome back. My name is John Barber. This is the second video on immunodeficiencies. In the first video, we covered uh, severe combined immunodeficiency, Bruton's AG hemoglobinemia, and common variable immunodeficiency. In this video, we're going to cover Wiscott Aldrich, chronic granulomatous disease, Chediaki Gashi, and leukocyte adhesion deficiency. So first, Wiscott Aldrich, this acronym water is very helpful. Uh, the disease is caused by a gene defect in the WASP gene, which uh, T cells are unable to reorganize their act, uh, actin cytoskeleton, uh, which leads to recurrent infections. You also get thrombocytopenia and eczema. There's more general problem going on with the immune system, however. So you also have some, for reasons that aren't quite clear, uh, B cell selective maturation processes. So you actually get increased levels of IgA and IgE. And that is why in the acronym you can see a the A and E a bit larger, it's trying to remember that. And again, because the immune system is a little bit of out, of out of whack, you're at increased risk of malignancies such as leukemias and lymphomas. In trying to give some rhyme or reason to the immunodeficiency states, it is really useful to pull this one out and think of it as a defect of the cytoskeleton. The pathogenetic defect is characterized by abnormal actin polymerization due to a defect in the WASP protein. And here is the key slide to appreciating this immunodeficiency. Pictured here is a T lymphocyte interacting with the dendritic cell. This interaction is described by the immunologic synapse. With the defect in the cytoskeleton, the synapse does not form. If you can appreciate the failure of this interaction, then you can appreciate the immune dysregulation that takes place with this syndrome. The T cell requires signaling from the dendritic cell to activate. Pictured on the left is a normal lymphocyte demonstrating the actin-dependent villus projections. On the right, you can see a bald lymphocyte, that is, no cytoskeleton rearrangements. Note the new name, Wiscott Baldrige, bald lymphocytes that can't interact with dendritic cells. So here goes. We have inadequate T-cell regulation, and how does that manifest? Eczema. Be prepared for a clinical description of eczema. It will be described as a dry pruritic erythematous rash. Be aware as they may not tell you in direct terms that the baby has eczema. Besides T cell failure and dysregulation, Wiscott Baldrich is also associated with B cell failure. Recall that T cells directly activate B cells as well as indirectly through release of cytokines. So the failure of T cells causes a consequent failure of B cells. So this is a big ticket item. The cytoskeleton defects affects cells of hematopoietic origin, including platelets. They too have abnormal cytoskeleton. We already know what happens with abnormal platelets and RBCs for that matter. Can you say splenic macrophage? The spleen clears defective platelets causing significant thrombocytopenia. And although we are presenting immunodeficiencies, the main cause of death in these patients is bleeding. The platelet count is down, and due to that cytoskeleton defect, the platelets are described as being small in size. And here is a summary of what I just demonstrated. Cytoskeleton failure with eczema, low platelets, and the full array of infections, including virus, fungi, bacterial, and protozoa. As with other states, they won't ask you the treatment, but treatment does underscore the immune defect. Prophylactic antibiotics, antifungals, antivirals, platelet support, and IVIG. This syndrome is also reported in your review manuals with elevation of IgA and IgE. From the diagnostic perspective, this is a small sidebar reflecting the hypermetabolic state associated with antibody production. It just so happens the synthesis is greater than clearance accounting for the elevated levels. These play no role in pathogenesis or in our understanding of this disorder. And here is the brief pictorial summary. Cytoskeleton defect with ball lymphocytes that don't interact with dendritic cells. Eczema is present, especially on the face and diaper region, and the platelet defects are a major component of this condition. Decreased number and size of platelets with significant bleeding complications. Let's move on to the neutrophilic disorders. My commentaries will be shorter, I swear. 
chronic granulomatous disease. Uh, for this one, the normal pathway, so when we have bacterial infection at our neutrophil uh, cell borders, um, oxygen is converted to oxygen uh, radicals via NADPH oxidase. That is then converted to H2O2 by superoxide dismutase and then to HOCl, hydrochlorous acid, by myeloperoxidase. So in chronic granulomatous disease, you are NADPH oxidase deficient. As a result, you're not able to uh, complete this pathway, and so you are at an impaired ability to fight bacterial infections and fungal infections. However, not all. Most bacteria and fungi uh, produce H2O2 as a byproduct of their own uh, activities, cellular activities. And our body is clever. It's able to take that H2O2 uh, from the bacteria and fungi and, again, just do this last step in, the, in this pathway, producing the hydrochlorous acid and, again, being able to destroy the uh, bacteria and fungi. Unfortunately, some bacteria and fungi are catalyst positive, uh, and as such, they are able to break down the H2O2 themselves, uh, thereby preventing our body from being able to use it to produce the hydrochlorous acid. Uh, those bacteria and fungi, um, I remember Che plans, like Che Guevara plans something, I don't know what, you can decide what he's planning, uh, but Candida, H. pylori, E. coli, Pseudomonas, Listeria, Aspergillus, Nocardia, Staph, and Serratia. Those are the catalyzed positive organisms uh, that you need to know. For diagnosis, uh, there's the dihydrorhodamine test, which you take the patient's uh, whole blood and stain it with DHR. You then incubate and stimulate that blood to produce superoxide radicals, which oxidize the DHR uh, to rhodamine, uh, and then which produces a green fluorescence. In patients with CJD, they won't be able to produce those superoxide radicals, and so you won't get that green fluorescence. So a negative uh, test, no green fluorescence, means that you have the disease. I have little to add to the information just presented. Given the association with staph and staphylococcal catalase production, most students are familiar with this disorder. I would be sure you understand the two diagnostic tests, including nitroblue tetrazoleum and the dihydrorhodamine fluorescence test. These are often part of the question stem or the question answer. The other issue is related to the catalase producing bugs. I would suggest it is less about memorizing the bugs that make catalase, rather it is the other way around. If they give you a patient with Burkholder growing out of the sputum, they are telling you the patient has chronic granulomatous disease and be ready for the derivative question on failure of the respiratory burst, reactive oxygen species, or a question on the missing enzyme, NADPH oxidase. So let's continue to Chediakagashi syndrome. Next up is Chediakigashi syndrome. So Chediakigashi syndrome is caused by LIST gene fact, that's lysosomal trafficking gene. This is a microtubule dysfunction causing abnormal intracellular trafficking. Uh, phagolysosome fusion is impaired. That results in increased risk of pyogenic infections, uh, most commonly staph and strep. Uh, neutrophils aren't able to secrete their granules, and so uh, on a slide you'll see neutrophils with huge granules, intracellular granules, uh, scattered throughout them. But this isn't just an amino deficiency problem. That's what's most troubling. But uh, it's a general microtubule dysfunction overall. And so the melanocytes are also unable to pass off their melanosomes to the keratinocytes. And so the patient will, will have partial albinism. And then platelets are also impaired in some of their function, and so you can have coagulation defects. So the key point to notice in this immunodeficiency is the name, Chediak Higashi syndrome, abbreviated CHS. Well, CHS also happens to stand for California Highway System, which is convenient. If you think about LA traffic, you have this one lit. Failure to traffic lysosomes accounts for the immunodeficiency state. Once you can link this syndrome to trafficking, we are on our way. Having acknowledged the trafficking problem, it is easy to sort out the clinical presentation. The PMNs can't transport the lysosome, so there is no formation of phagolysosomes. What's that mean? Infection. PMNs can't kill microbes. Soft tissue infections ensue. What's up with the melanocytes? They are present, plenty of them. But we're dealing with a trafficking problem. The melanocytes can traffic melanin. These patients wind up with partial albinism. There are also neural manifestations with granule accumulation in the Schwann cell, and although the neural manifestations are clinically important, the mechanism here is less certain. In terms of distinguishing features, 
the giant cytoplasmic granules are pathognomonic. When it comes to USMLE prep, pathognomonic is a big ticket item. If they tell you these granules are the hallmark of this trafficking disorder, it is bulletin board material and you need to know it. Those granules, by the way, are azurophilic granules, just like in AML, rich in myeloperoxidase. The other clinical feature that will absolutely be mentioned is that partial albinism. And here is that pictorial representation. Giant granules, failure of melanin transport, and an emphasis on Chediac Higashi as a trafficking defect with a failure to create the phagolysosome. Last up is leukocyte adhesion deficiency. This is caused by a defect in LFA1 integrin. If you remember, uh, as, as the leukocytes are in the blood vessels, they're rolling along the blood vessel walls by the means of selectins that are holding, that are sort of attaching them to the walls, and they roll along. And then when the integrins bind, uh, that causes the cells to adhere and then extravasate into the surrounding tissue, and then migrate uh, and chemotax to the site of infection. If the with the integrin defect. Uh, the leukocytes are unable to actually integrate through and get to the source of infection. And so their patients are at a much increased risk for bacterial skin and mucosal infections. Uh, they'll have neutrophilia because the body's still able to produce the neutrophils, but there will be no pus at the site of infection, again, because the, the neutrophils can't get out of the blood vessels into the tissue. Um, there will be impaired wound healing. And the last one is delayed separation of the umbilical cord. It's not actually that common in real life, but it's very unique to leukocyte adhesion deficiencies. They like to test, test you on it. And finally, leukocyte adhesion defect. The challenge in leukocyte adhesion defect is simply remembering the characteristic language. If you can simply recall that the neutrophil can't migrate out of the circulation into the infected soft tissue, we're in good shape. In fact, that is the clinical hallmark absence of pus formation at sites of infection. So what is the prototypic wound infection? Well, the umbilicus. That makes sense as it is the newborn's first infectious challenge and it fails that test. The umbilicus gets infected, called omphalitis. Not only does it get infected, but it won't fall off, described as failure of umbilical cord separation. The only other piece of information to recall is the basis of that adhesion defect being a failure of integrins. It would be the beta chain associated with CD11 and 18 to be exact. You won't have to recall this specifically, but don't start making things up if they include that information. And again, here's the pictorial representation of leukocyte adhesion defect, omphalitis, and failure of cord separation. Truth told, I kept my cord attached just in case things didn't work out in my life. I've included a picture of CD18 integrin and the beta chain just to get a sense of what we're talking about. And finally, a wound infection without pus. Do note, however, there are plenty of WBCs, they just never leave the circulation. And that concludes this two-part video series on the primary immunodeficiencies for USMLE Step 1. Much gratitude to John on his approach to the disorders and finally getting me involved in this very high-yield topic. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please email me at 12 Days in March. Thank you.